You're not going to want to miss this episode of the AI Show where we talk all about res the responsible AI mitigation and tracker. Make sure you tune in. Hello and welcome to this episode of the AI Show. We're talking all about the responsible AI mitigations and tracker with my good friends, Vesmira and Mara. How you doing, my friends? Great. Thanks for having us, Seth. Fantastic. So why don't you introduce yourselves? We'll start with you, Vesmira. Hi, um, I'm Vesmira. I'm a researcher in Microsoft Research. I work on tools for responsible AI. Fantastic. Mara. Hi, I'm Mara. I'm a, a research engineer. I work in Microsoft Research, and I love all things machine learning. Me too. We're on the right show. So let's start first with the obvious question, at least for me, and we'll go to you, Basmira. What does it mean to be responsible with AI? Thanks for asking that, Seth. Uh, there's so many definitions of what does it mean to be responsible. Um, I'll give an unconventional definition today uh, that is perhaps closer to machine learning engineering. Um, with this toolbox and the new tools, what we're saying is that to be responsible means to be careful in your day-to-day -day engineering steps. It means um, that you should be able to identify your errors in um, a streamlined fashion. It means that you'd be able to diagnose why those errors are happening. And it also means that you take an informed decision and not just like a trial and error approach when you try to mitigate those errors. Um, and all things considered um, responsible, it also means that you need to validate all the actions that have been taken in this life cycle. So, I mean, that's an awesome definition, but it feels like there's like some extra work you have to do and there's some tooling or whatever. How does someone begin to start to do that, to build machine learning models responsibly? Yeah, so um, no surprises there. Um, all these things that I mentioned, they are easier said than done. Uh, when it comes to implementing them in practice, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of uh, code that you need to write from scratch for every project. What we're doing with Responsible AI Toolbox is trying to accelerate all of these processes and um, build tools that can help engineers do this in their day-to-day -day work. And um, hopefully, you know, get uh, faster results uh, without doing a lot of the trial and error that unfortunately we still have to do. With All right. So I, it, that sounds awesome. I feel like Mara, can you show us how this is done? Yes. Today I'm going to give you a demo of this. Okay. So what you see here in today's demo, I'm going to show you how we can combine our three responsible AI tools. And so what you're looking at here is a Jupyter Lab um, environment where I've already installed our Jupyter Lab extension, RI Tracker, our first tool of the day. So a little bit about RI Tracker. Um, it's a tool to help you compare, visualize, and validate different model experiments and improvements. So, um, and by the way, you can install it yourself very easily with a simple pip install. Ooh. So let's jump right in here. I have my first notebook, which I've already imported, my baseline notebook. Okay. In this notebook, I'm loading um, the UCI income data set, and I'm training a LIGBM classifier for a binary classification where if the individual in the data set has, uh, for your reference, an income higher than or equal to 50K, then it's a positive label. Otherwise, it's a negative label. So Got it. Before yeah, so before training my uh, model, I am doing a little bit of data pre-processing. So using our second tool, the RI, the RI mitigations library, and a little bit about it, it's a Python library. Again, you can install it with a simple pip, um, and it offers what we call a non-fragmented experience, where you can improve the data in a way that improves the performance on the model. And so you can you'll see under multiple ways of how to use this library throughout the demo but here it's very simple we're just using it for an imputation and encoding pipeline before training the model and then simply i just uh train save the model and then what i do is i i register it in ri tracker and i've already registered it here but i'll show you a little bit what the interface looks like we have our model but along with the model we have a test data set um, that the, the, the tracker can use to evaluate the model throughout these experiments. Okay. Can I ask a couple questions? Yes. So the first question is this pipeline, is 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 that like a 
scikit learn pipeline or is that pipeline like something from the rai toolbox this the one i'm using here it is a scikit learn pipeline Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. But, but every but every mitigation within the pipeline i'm using is from the, the RI mitigations library i see wow. so the data for example the one hot encoding i'm guessing is what the encoder is doing is that something that's in the mitigations library to be able to understand what's happening as it's as it's going in so that's the first question the second question is you clicked on something inside of the jupyter notebook that showed a model thing is that part of the rai tracker as well do you, do you know what i'm talking about yeah so i i'm guessing you're talking about this. yes exactly this, this is part of the tracker this is part of the tracker interface i've already registered the model but here you will see a little register where that says register you click on it and then you can upload your model um you choose the platform and then you choose whatever data set you want to evaluate it on this is all part of the tracker interface and it's you know it's clean it's easy for the user to use and this you would do after after you train, like for example, this light GBM model with the pipeline. Correct. Correct. Got it. Okay. Cool. I understand. Mm -hmm. So in the back end, I've saved it and then I've registered it. Correct. Fantastic. Okay. So um, we'll look a little bit more about the accuracies and the metrics of this model in a little bit. But before, I want to take a closer look at the data itself. So and that's where our third and final tool, which we've talked about here on the show, um, but it's the R the responsible AI. Dashboard. I'm just going to remind you of what it is. So okay. here I'm using the RI widgets Py uh, Python library. I'm propagating the widget, and I've opened it here. And the first thing here we see is an error analysis uh, tree. So um, we can see an 18 or 19 percent error rate, which you know, which matches our 81 percent accuracy here. But if we look at the data itself, not just not just overall but for specific cohorts, such as this one, we see you know, a bit of a full circle, which indicating there's more errors. Um, for this cohort here, it's for individuals whose relationship is husband or wife. So let's say there are married individuals, right? So if we have a, almost a 35, a little more than 35% error rate compared to the non-married individuals with only a little more than 5% error rate. So that's quite a big difference. Right, and you know, it could be part of the reason why um, something we can something we can mitigate and improve in, in the model. So, to do that, I'm just going to take another look here at something on the in the label distribution. Okay, so we have our full data. We can see there's a skewness here towards the negative label. There are less positive labels than the negative labels. But uh, what about the cohorts that we saw up just up there? And mind you here, I've, I've already created these cohorts, but using this button right here, and you can very easily create any cohorts you like, combining different aspects of the data. Um, but here we have on the merit cohort, what we noticed is there's a bit more of a balance right, compared to the full data. And let's just keep that information in mind as we move forward with our experimentation. And before moving on, I'm just gonna look at the not merit cohort. Ooh. we see a bit more a bit more similar to the full data. Again, we see the skewness towards the negative label. So now that we know this information, let's go back to the tracker and try to build on top of that to mitigate some of these issues and improve the model itself. Okay, so I've already imported my second my second notebook, same data set, um, also a light GBM classifier. But what I'm doing here before training, before doing the pre-processing and, 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 and training the model, I'm using an extra mitigation here. For, again, from our library, from the RI mitigations library, um, using uh, the rebalancing mitigation to rebalance the full data. The, and here I'm using um, an oversampling strategy where really we're just sampling enough data points to create a balance between the two classes for the full data set. Um, and so the same thing here, I get my new X and Y after resampling, the same pipeline, um, and then save the model again. And then I, of course, I have to register it. Um, mind you that I'm using the same data set, the same test data set, because I would like to compare the two. And of course here, we can look at the accuracy. There's some improvement, but before getting there, what I wanna see, again, I wanna look at this label distribution post rebalancing. And I'm going to do that here within my notebook very easily um, using some one of my favorite parts of our, our, our RI mitigations library, and that's the cohort manager. The cohort manager class, it lets you do what we did in the widget where we created or looked at these cohort within mm -hmm. your Python code very easily. You don't have to do it. You, 
you don't have to do it manually. You just give it um, the filters that you'd like to add for your cohorts. And then um, using uh, <clears throat> a transformation pipeline, we can simply create these cohorts and look at the distribution, plot the distribution for both of them. Okay, so here we have our full data. Obviously, we did a rebalancing over full data. So as expected, we have a very balanced uh, full data set. But if we look at the married cohorts, we can see there's a bit more uh, imbalance than before. And that's because we have a lot more positive labels now. And that's probably because in the very in, in the beginning, you know, most of the positive labels were in the married cohorts. And so after the rebalancing, they came from the married cohort. Compared to the not married cohort, that's still very much imbalanced. Okay. So what we can do here, now that we have all this information, we can compare our baseline to this new model. Um, and now that I've registered both of them, I can click on this compare models button here and I will get this tab where I can see a visualization of this comparison. So um, I've selected both the baseline and this new notebook mm -hmm. and looking at the accuracy, we see some improvement, right? Um, but mind you, there's there seems to be quite a bit of drop in the precision. Uh, but why, why is that? Let's, let's look at the cohorts again. We can create the cohorts within the RI tracker itself, not just in the, our, the mitigations library or the widgets, but again, all these, all these tools are meant to work together. They're meant to be compatible. So I've created here already are the married and not married cohorts. Again, similar to like in the widget in the library. So I'm going to add them in for a more detailed look. Let's start with the baseline. You can see that the not married cohort already has quite quite a decent performance in the first place. The married cohort after uh, post pardon me post rebalancing, the married cohort seems to have improved in accuracy. But again, we see this drop in precision and um, not much change for the not married cohort. So this really gets us thinking: if this is the case, why don't we uh, try a more targeted approach where we can simply focus on the married cohort? And since the not married cohort already has decent performance, why don't we just leave it as it is? Um, and again, this could help because um, most of the positive labels were sampled from married core. And this could really be what's hurting the precision. So given that, our final notebook here, which I'll pause right there just so I can ask a question. So the first rebalance, mm -hmm. you're basically rebalancing based upon the label. Is that right? Correct. Um, I'm, balance, I'm rebalancing um, the full data set based mm -hmm. upon the labels, correct? I want an equal number of positive and negative labels for the full data. I see. And when you do mm -hmm. that, does, it, does the data set get smaller or do you resample multiple times to make the data set the same size-ish? Um, you can, so we, we, so given an oversampling strategy, we synthesize some new data sets, some new, oh, sorry, some new data points. If that makes sense. That makes sense. And so when you when you were because the first thing we noticed is that there was an imbalance in the label. Mm -hmm. We rebalanced the label, and when we rebalanced the label, we noticed that we were having some precision problems in another cohort of data because there was an imbalance in that particular feature as well. Am I getting this right? Yes, and because because we we did the rebalance over the full data. Um, it didn't get, it, it couldn't, you know, it wasn't targeted to a specific cohort. So it didn't know where to add new positive labels and where not to add new positive labels. So that makes sense. So That's it nice. was, it was a very blanket approach. And so it, it didn't give us, it could, that's why it hurt precisions for the married cohort, for example. And that makes sense because the, the, the married, not married, there was an imbalance there to start. And when mm -hmm. we oversampled, we kind of kept that. We oversampled balanced one label, but it didn't cause the other one to fix. And so now we're going to go look and see how we can fix that particular problem. Okay, makes sense. Correct. Let's do it. Okay, so um, our last notebook here. All right, so what I want to do here, I want to focus on the married cohort. So again, using our cohort manager class, we can create the cohorts very nicely. And this time I'm not just plotting I'm not just using the cohort manager just to plot the label distribution, but rather I'm using it to uh, train to, to fit two different pipelines, two different transformation pipelines. And so our first pipeline you can see here has a rebalancing, um, a, a rebalancing <clears throat> mitigation, but the second pipeline is, is empty right now. So what I, so after transforming um, the two cohorts, I resample, I get my new X and Y. And this way the not married cohort and as we said, Seth, it's untouched. I did not do anything to it. 
So post this, I can do the over the full, over the new X and Y. I do the same pipeline and the same estimator, save my model um, and register it, of course. And before looking at the comparison with back to the back to our tab here, let's do the same thing and look at the new label distribution. So we see over the full data sets, a bit more balanced than before. However, the married cohorts are perfectly balanced and the not married cohorts have not been affected, have not been affected by the rebalance specifically. Right. And that was our goal in the first place, right? So let's see how that looks like in the comparison tab. Okay, so of course I've registered the model with the same data, with the same test set, um, and I'm going to add it in right here. Okay, so over the full data, we see a 4% improvement in the accuracy. That's pretty nice, that's better than before. Over the, for the merit cohort, and 9% improving the accuracy. Again, that's even better than before. That's great. But, but as expected, the not married cohort has not been affected. Um, but more importantly, what I think is the, plus, the most positive outcome of this is that the precision was not as hurt. We have a lower hit in the precision. And it's again, the benefit of this more targeted approach where we focus on the cohorts that need our improvement rather than just a blanket uh, mitigation. And so this is basically how we use these you know, these tools together to iteratively build and improve our models in a way that tells the full story. And that's pretty cool because it's like you're basically doing data science over a single model, but you're working on the data. Usually when I'm doing this stuff, I'm like just trying different models mm -hmm. to get better accuracy, but it's more nuanced than that because you also have to look at the data. Is that what I'm getting from this, Bismira? Yeah, that is a, a, a very nice way to, to phrase it, Seth. Um, basically, we're coming here from another end, which is like the data end. And since we're all doing like data science, machine learning models are trained with data, uh, good quality data transfers to good models. And it's something that perhaps we have overlooked a little bit in uh, machine learning, and we need to go back and put more emphasis in, in that end. And I absolutely love that because I always tell people that machine learning is just a lazy way of writing functions with data. But if your data isn't good and you, you can't look at it in an analytical way, you're yeah. kind of not being responsible, right? Yeah. You cannot always hope for the best. That's true. So let's talk about this. Where can people go to find out more? Bismira. Yeah, so um, a couple of things. We wrote an end-to-end -end blog post that puts all these three tools together, the dashboard, the mitigations library, and tracker. And um, obviously the GitHub repositories, everything is connected in uh, the responsible AI toolbox uh, repositories. Everything uh, comes with a dash um, name um, GitHub uh, repository, and you'll be able to, to find them under the Microsoft org. Well, this has been delightful. Thank you so much, Mara, and thank you so much, Bezmira. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Yes. Awesome, we've been learning all about Responsible AI Mitigation and Tracker with Bismira and Mara. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully we'll see you next time. Take care.